Welcome to the Grappling We Re- See exactly. Grappling Rewind Podcast. Welcome to this week on the Grappling Rewind Podcast. On this week's show, we are going to recap Polaris 9. We're going to recap Fight to Win 105 in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Gilbert Burns versus Gleason Tebow on Titan Fights 53. We are also going to preview the EBI 19 Combat Jiu-Jitsu 135-pound thing they're doing and the IBJJF pans. As always, I'm your host, Maine, here with my co-host, Emil. How you doing, Emil? I channeled my inner uh, Seth Daniels and Maine and completely fucked my hand up rolling and continued to roll and now my hand is jacked up and swollen so my back my back is still working <laughs> so uh, so i feel i yeah. hope you guys are proud <laughs> yeah i can't believe i just messed up the intro there i'm, I'm gonna leave it in yeah so okay. uh before we get into anything let's get into news so in the biggest news of all time ibjjf has now announced that you're gonna get paid if you win a world championship yeah it's i think the heat is finally catching up to them this goes back to what we were saying where like yeah, they're the biggest dogs in the game, but they used to be the only dogs in the game. And now, I don't know, man. Like UAE JJF is catching up. U- UAE JJF and just all of the paid events. Like there is a a an economy now around grappling, and they have to catch up. And yeah. it's you know they got to really think about how they are treating the athletes. Um, you know, because there are other options now. Yeah, and there's a lot of other options. I think it's really interesting that the winner gets – if you win a world championship at the black belt level for IBJJF, if you have more than 33 competitors in your division, it's seven grand, which is something. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's – It's it's not bad. I mean, it's a little low, but it's something. It's it's better than nothing. Right. But I definitely think and that it's a – To be fair, there are a lot of black belt divisions. You know, it's, it's a full, you know – yeah, I'm, I'm I'm assuming it's all of the adult divisions. I'm yeah, because it's not, it's the, just for the world. It's not for Masters World. Yeah, so I don't think it was for Masters. I think it was just for so the regular world's not Masters World. You worlds. gotta figure there's probably what like between men and women's like twelve divisions. I mean, we can look this up yeah. exactly. Yeah, whatever. There's a lot. It's so like what? And then absolute you know, gets ten grand. Seven, which is which is impressive. That's yeah. That's that's actually that's respectable when you look at all of the people that they have to pay out. So it's it's good. It's better. I mean, considering that. You now have to register as a blue. I think there's a lot of things that they make a shitload of money, and right. it's something. And at least it's a step in the right direction. But it is big news, and I'm happy to be seeing uh, the best guys in the world in the gig getting paid finally yep. for their efforts. And I said, there's a couple of pro events, and they've added more pro events, so they're they are moving slowly in the correct direction, which which is good. I'm just happy that they're finally paying out the best dudes in the world. Um, in other news, uh, ADCC. Uh, refunded all the tickets. Yeah, that was that was buck wild. Um, that was buck wild. Well, I mean, it's it's unexpected, and um, I, there was some discrepancy. It sounded like with the uh, the ticketing like middlemen. So yeah, Mojasm is the guy that runs the. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but I'm probably not. Um, is the guy that runs the ADCC? Pretty much the runs it for the most part. And so he had a ticketing. Their ADCC had set up a ticketing. Um, third party yeah to deal with ticketing and paying and all that stuff and then the third party through something or a disagreement or a misunderstanding basically went okay we're done and refunded all of the previously purchased tickets for ADCC so if you did have tickets um, my money has been refunded now I checked it actually has been refunded so if you've purchased tickets for ADCC 2019 in Cali in Anaheim uh, you need to buy new tickets because the previous tickets will not work and are now voided. So, and they have a new location where you can get the tickets. If you go to the yep. Instagram uh, ADCC, they have it up. Yep, it's on a uh, Tixter, T I X R dot com, and you can look look up ADCC Championship 2019. It's uh the, t- the prices are all the same. The prices are going to go up here in like a couple weeks or a month. So, if you had previously bought your tickets, I want to stress that enough. I'm going to the event. I want to see a bunch. I want to see the event sell out because I think it's the biggest coolest event in grappling it's our it's our world championships so buy your tickets i don't think i have any other thing any other points to belabor that i do appreciate how mo handled it though yeah. he was like look this thing happened he was real upfront about he it he was very transparent about it and so. there was nothing weird it was just like hey they refunded everything we're gonna work on getting new tickets up quick the old tickets won't work we're really sorry about I think that it was less than 24 hours they had a new uh yeah a new, it was a, it was real quick website up so so that's what's going on. Um, let's see what other news I have. Oh, yeah, High Rollers has announced that they have a new closed format, and there's going to be no tickets, no registration. Um, 
And like, I'm not sure if it's no audience either. So it seems like they're almost going back to the old Meta Morris uh, way. And I think they had to deal with some consumption laws regarding like giving people <laughs> tons of weed as a prize for their event. Yeah. I don't know. So it's, yeah, that was an interesting development. I kind of, they ran fun events that seemed like, but it'll be interesting to see their new format and how that, how that plays out. But it was, that was big news that you really, basically it seems like you can't go to the event anymore. Yeah. So uh, in other news, Craig Jones has announced he's shooting a new DVD. Hell yeah. I'm not sure. It should be called Leg Locks Down Under, like Down Underer, <laughs> the more underer. Um, let's see what other news I've got. Um, oh, yeah. Dylan Danis versus Ben Askren. Do you have any interest in seeing that matchup? Because this, this is postulated. Basically, they were like, oh, we want to do a Polaris matchup between these two guys because they've In been talking a lot event. of shit. A grappling matchup because let's be serious. Like, that is not a competitive MMA fight. Like, say what you want about Askren. Like, no, dude, he would punk him. He would destroy him. I think he would punk him in a grappling match, too. You think You think Askren would beat him? Dylan Danis? Really? Yeah, dude. I, have you seen Askren in, like, straight-up grappling? The Marcelo footage or Pablo Popovich in ADCC? Like, dude has not been so hot when it comes to just straight-up... Pablo Popovich was, like, what, 2009? 2009. Yeah. ADCC? Yeah. 2009. Any ADCC that year. And it was a, uh, it was, I think it was a heel hook or something like that. I, I, d- I don't I remember. remember. The match is actually really hard to find. Yeah. Remember like six months ago or like eight months ago when I was in the chat asking like, where can I find this footage? And Josh was like, it's here and this thing, you got to buy it. Yeah. So that's what that was about. I was looking for that match. There's like a Marcelo match that is on. It's not a match. No, listen it, to this. Okay. There's a Marcelo match from ADCC that's on YouTube that I watch. I'm trying to remember who he was. Go- oh, it's Marcelo versus Cron Gracie. This, I remember this. Classic match. Listen, if, if you watch the match, I, I can't remember which. It, it's the 2009 match, obviously. So if you'd watch 2009, Cron Gracie versus Marcelo Garcia, in the background you hear, next up, uh, you know, Popovich versus Askren. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and yeah. then, like, fucking, like, 90 seconds later, they announced Popovich is the winner. So it was really quick. I, yeah, you, I haven't oh, seen you it. You can hear it, you can hear it in the, the background. Yeah, and I remember being like, oh, shit, that was fast. Like, Askren yeah. got fucking schooled. So that's why I honestly think, like, I think that Dylan, yeah. like, everyone shits on Dylan a little bit. Dude has some pretty legit grappling credentials, like su- submission grappling credentials that Askin doesn't have, and we've seen Askin be Meh. less than stellar when it comes to jujitsu. So I don't really have any in- urge to the matchup. No, but I think it's fun to speculate on like who you think would come on top. I think it's funny that you actually think Askin would take it, and I think Danis would take it. So that just makes me laugh. That's not literally. I not. I kind of sprung this on a meal before we were just just now. I didn't tell him this is the news, <laughs> and. Um, that is the complete opposite reaction to what I thought you'd have. Yeah, I'm going with Askren. All right. Uh, let's see what else. Bye, Bulldog um, choke. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, in other news, Tim Spriggs is out of Kasai due to injury. That Fuck. was just announced today. That sucks. Did you just learn that? Yeah. This is news to me. Oh. Thanks, man. Yeah, it sucks. Um, I, I don't really know anything about the injury. Just, it literally was just announced a couple hours ago. It sucks to see him out of that. I was super excited to see him in that. He's been really active in the lead-up to ADCC. So, Yeah, because I, I mean, they put on really exciting matchups. So, And I think they'll probably have somebody, somebody pretty exciting to replace him as well. Like, that sure. whole bracket looks stacked. And Kasai doesn't – they're not really ones to just slot in random guys. Like, most of the guys they always put on, even when the 145 bracket kind of fell apart a little bit, they still slotted in a bunch of, like, really, really top talent to fill that back out. So I'm not worried they're not going to be able to find a – was it 205 light heavyweight? Yeah. They're not going to find another 205 to get in there and slot in. So uh, you got any other news, Mail? No, that's it. All right, let's do it. Let's move to the recaps. So on to our recap of Polaris 9. This event took place at the O2 Arena in London in the UK, and it was headlined by Rafael Lovato Jr. defeating Jake Shields by decision. <laughs> so You got it. You finally got it. So what you've just missed is I paused the recording and literally stared at Rafael's name and said it over and over and over again. Dude, jujitsu has me conditioned bad. If I see an R in a first name, that's an H now. Yeah. Like, it's bad. I'm, I guarantee I'm going to do it during this segment. Yeah, so no, I can't wait. What event? What what event? What match do you want to start up with for this we'll, card? We'll start at the top. Uh, start at uh, Rafael. Oh man, it's so hard. Rafael Lovato defeating Jake Shields. Yeah. So um, this was this did not go down the way that I thought it would. Um, I thought Lovato was gonna just take it to Shields and like sub him in. Pro- I thought it was like no, first I, four or no eight way. minutes. No, Jake Shields is Jake Shields is ridiculously. But hard we to we saw the Craig Jones matchup. 
depth, but heel hook like 20 seconds. That was the last time we saw Shields on Polaris. Yeah. And I thought, I thought Lovato, I honestly put Lovato above Jones as far as like submission gap. He submitted some monsters and so is, so is Jones. Don't get me wrong, but I just feel like we've seen Lovato be way more consistent in his subbing of good guys. And I just thought that, you know, given Shields last performance against, uh, against Craig Jones, I thought it would be a similar thing, maybe a little more positional from Lovato with the wrestling, but this match should not go at all like I thought I it was going to go. I was surprised. I was more surprised with how well Raphael took down Jake Shields. That know, was like, impressive because I thought he would have foot trip. Like you know, we saw him hit that on Muhammad Ali in ADCC some year when they fought, and it was it was a it wasn't just a takedown. It was a takedown into side control. You know, yeah. it was like a strong fucking takedown. Lovato's really good about getting like the body lock grip and then rotating his opponent as he drops him. Like we've seen, there's and there's a highlight that it's one of my favorite. It's probably almost is my favorite highlight. Every time uh, Raphael is going to be on fight to win. They play this like highlight of like the lion. It's it basically it's the same it's the Rafael Lovato highlight. And it shows him doing this almost exact take on Muhammad Ali. And I watched that thing like six or eight times every time Lovato is going to be on fight to win and I love it and it's this exact same take that he hits on Jake Shields. He doesn't quite land in side control on Ali, but he lands it on Shields cuz Shields is a more similar size to him than Ali. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it goes to show I mean how strong Jake Shields is cuz like that Raphael was like got deep Kimura grips at one point. And, oh, yeah. Like I was like, he's about to rip that arm out, but yeah, I was honestly, it was it was competitive. I came away from this match way more impressed than Jake in, in Jake Shields' grappling ability than I had before. I mean, not that sounds super weird and wrong. Like Jake Shields is a monster grappler, but we've seen him struggle a little bit against really, really good straight up jujitsu guys. And so it was it was cool to see him actually take Lovato to a decision here. And um, it wasn't quite as action packed as I would have liked it, but you it saw had moments. You know. Yeah, you had its moments, and you saw Lovato really put a ton of pressure on Shields, and Shields really take that well. And it honestly makes me more excited to see Shields and stuff like Fight to Win and Polaris in the future. So I'm like, yeah, he's he's trained with the DDS guys, and he is still a guy that can really put up in a grappling match. And so I kind of got to eat my lumps, take my lumps here on on my predictions last week. So well, before we continue. Let's take a step back and talk about Polaris in general. Uh, they have a rule set that is uh, three five-minute periods. So, But it's they don't break it up. So they right. do a 15-minute match, and then they judge it on the first five minutes, the second five minutes, the third five minutes. And I actually like that style of judging, but some of these matches get a little get a little long. Yeah. it's it, it, if, it 15 minutes is, in my esteem, in most overall formats too long in in that people are going to know that you know one strategy to win 15 minute match is a battle of attrition and so people will conserve energy a lot in these matches and what we you and i both actually you brought me over initially i really liked like eight and ten and 12 minute matches i think talking to you in the past like six or eight months since you've been on the show you've really brought me around to like more enjoying the six minute match. And I think a lot of that is to do with the pacing. Like yeah. for a six minute match, you can't view the hand fight on the feet for anything more than a couple minutes, right? You've eaten half your matchup. Yeah. With a 15 minute match, you really should be feeling your guy out for it's the first two or three minutes. Feeling. Or... It's like if you if you are going ham on takedown attempts for, for a minute or two and the person's playing defensive, you have burned a ton of energy. Yeah. You, know? you may still have ten or twelve minutes of a match remaining yeah. that that guy like has defended and potentially is kind of Dude, is gonna be significantly more fresh because you've like done you could big go lifts. hard for five minutes. And then still have ten fucking minutes left. You still have two regular like yeah. gym rounds left. So it's just, it, I think you know, I think fifteen minutes is long. What is great is Polaris is put up on UFC Fight Pass. It's a slick system. You can click on each match that you want to watch. It puts you the match up for you, and then if you want, you can put on time markers. Where, Always put on time markers. Just like well, I don't heard, don't if yeah don't put on I the time this. markers if. You don't want spoilers because the time markers will tell you when there are submission attempts, takedowns. It'll also tell you when the match ends. And if if you see that it ends early or whatever, you're like, okay, there's what, what here. screwed me up is I watched the Gilbert Burns. We're gonna talk about this in a little bit. The Gilbert Burns versus Clayson Tebow match on uh, I watched that on tape delay and I clicked it up and I saw um, I saw the little end match, little end symbol, which is a little red dot for Fight Pass. 
and I was watching, and then all of a sudden I see Dorino get the back, and it's real, real close to the end. I went, oh, I, I bet he chokes him. Yeah. And then he did, and I went, man, I just had that spoiled for myself by, exactly. by me trying. And I do that all the, I've done that on Quintet before. When I watch Quintet on tape delay, I'm like, what? Oh, right, he's going to sub him here. Yep. Or it's really great when you watch it, and it's like the match starts, and then you see the little dot immediately. You're like, what happens in the next Flying. 12 in the, in the next twelve seconds? <laughs> so, so turn that off if you're watching it for the first time, if you don't want spoilers. But right. great, just amazing system for watching and rewatching stuff. Yeah. It buffers really well. You can jump forward. You can jump back. Like I think it has Fight Pass is one of, if not the best interface. I think it's better than YouTube, honestly, because it has those little yeah. time markers. Yeah, and like, yeah, 100%. For watching fights, yep. it's amazing. It's great. It's worth uh, 10 bucks a month. Oh yeah, is uh, it that? Is it that much? I think so. Yeah, I want to say I get a bill for like ninety five, ninety seven oh, every you do year. The one, I do the. Yeah, I do, yeah. I've had it for years and yeah, years yeah, yeah. and years and years for UFC, sure. and I'm so happy that I watch way less grappling now. And oh, sorry, way less, way less MMA. Grappling. Way less MMA now. Um, like I used to watch every single fight every single weekend yeah. for like UFC and UC two other organizations, and now I love that they have Polaris, Quintet, EBI, like. Yeah. Almost every once or twice a month, you can usually watch a professional grappling event on Fight Pass now. So it, for what we do the show, it makes it worth it to me now. Yep, hundred so, percent. Anything else on that match? Nah. Rafael, God damn it! Rafael wins the decision over Jake Shields. Okay, next up we have Fion Davies defeating Gazari Matuda by head and arm triangle. Holy shit! This man. was an exciting match. This was a fucking great so Fion match. Fion is a newer black belt, and Gazari is a veteran black belt and this was a 155 pound title match for the women and this is a match i had my, had my eye on and it delivered yo 100 percent. so gazari starts off by getting fion in an arm in uh arm in guillotine and it looked fucking dangerous. and i was like oh and she's gonna get her yeah and then fion gets out I was fion like, escapes, oh shit i'm really she impressed gets an awesome body lock trip straight into side control and gets to mount and then she just like puts the afterburners on, gets the arm triangle, and just fucking cranks you, you have that made shit. this match way less exciting than it was. Go back. This is a, this is a match you should go back and go back and rewatch because um, it was really really good and it was it showed that the women can push the pace. Oh, dude, of, yeah, it was like there's so few, we uh, we get to cover less women's matches on this show than I would like, and I love it when you get matches like this. Going, hey, women's just use really fucking good. It's really exciting. This was. Maybe one of the better matches, one of the best matches on the card. I think it like, was, yeah. Yeah, this was this is if you're gonna go back and watch a match from this event, it is this matchup. It's awesome. And dude, Fion looked really, really good. She looks fucking amazing. I mean, being able to you know, in jujitsu you have to be able to not just throw the submissions on, but also be able to like, you know, survive and then you know, I thought she was going to get her with the arm in. Dude, I thought... It looked... I was like, oh, she's going to get her. And then I did not think Fiona was going to get Gazeri with the head and arm and shit. I was like, oh, this was so... Just those two moments alone are really, really exciting because you're watching it like, oh, it looks like it's tight. It looks like it's in. But the and, takedown was fucking aggressive as shit too, man. Oh, yeah. It was fucking awesome. It was really active. And Gazeri's a pretty aggressive grappler. We see her. We've seen her on Polaris. We've seen her on a bunch of stuff before. We cover her pretty frequently on stuff. And these... Both these ladies push the pace of the exciting. I also love Fion Davis because she has a post or a really famous picture of her, which is her at some IBJJF event, and she has like a bow and arrow from the back on someone, and she's doing like a little smile, like a ha, huh. like and she doesn't look like it's gonna work. And there's so many captions on like when you've had the choking for ten seconds and uh, you're not sure if they're still moving. Yeah. And there's all <laughs> these like it's it's a meme picture and it's it's hilarious. So great to see this match. Really a lot of fun. Move on to the next one. Yeah. All right, so this is a men's number one contender match. We had Mr. Competition, Wagner Hosha, defeating Ross Nichols by decision. Yeah, um, I would say, you know, the last period, the last five-minute period of this was my favorite. Um, I, that was actually, so because, I don't have to cut you off completely, but I'm going to, Ross Nichols, I think, won the last five minutes of this. So the Polaris judges things in threes. So the right. first, the second, and the third quarter of the match. Wagner, this was one where I was like, ooh, potentially... Like, this could be judged. I think Wagner, if you look at the match as a whole, definitely wins it. Um, again, I'm biased towards fight to win rule sets. So, like, I think Ross threw up more submission attempts, but you saw Wagner really didn't have to defend many of them. No, he didn't have to defend. And I mean, like, so Wagner was just pressuring the shit out of Ross for like the first two periods and even into the third. Ross gets a really nice leg lock attempt uh, with great control of both of Wagner's legs, but Wagner's able to you know 
basically clear his knee line and, and no then, sell it. Yeah, and he just looks like there's nothing there. And, and then, I'm like, he convinced me. I was like, I'm pretty sure you actually are in a little bit of danger here. And Vagner's just like, nah, nah, no, I'm not. And he gets up and he responds with just savage passing. And at this point, he, you know, he he has aggressive passing to begin with, but now he goes into the okay, I'm gonna like smother your mouth. I'm gonna prove a point with passing. I'm gonna like jam my like my hand in your throat so oliver gettys who's the referee for this match i think it's Oliver Gettys. oh yeah that's right a he couple a couple of times like stops back and goes hey because wait what you can do so if you're unfamiliar with like the intricacies of like little rules you can do um hold your hand open like you're making a like a, a c with, like a c with your hand so it's facing up you can pressure down into someone's neck from like the guard or something like that if you have a flat open hand where the thumb is on one side of the of the You're making an l with the, your thumb compared to the rest yeah. of your fingers and then you can push that straight in but you can't squeeze your hand closed on the neck of the trachea right you can't you try also, to crush the the windpipe yeah with your right by, with your fingers by squeezing in you yeah. also can't thumb the windpipe right and, and wagner i think at one point is doing one of those things because all get is clarifies he goes hey hey Hey, you can't do this, but he basically and you, the commentators don't really address it. But you can see that he stopped the match and he's showing Wagner like the hand position that he's deeming is acceptable for what Wagner's doing. Right, and you're like, God damn, Wagner, you are gonna bend the rules everywhere. Every, he goes. But I Dude, respect it. It's good. In the, in the third round, there's even a point where like Wagner is he's in like top side control or like even top half, and he just takes his his knee that's closest to. Uh, the head of Ross Nichols and just starts grinding it into his temple. Like yeah. he's like he's just making this like, you know, I don't know if he's going for points or just trying to like kind of crush the will out of Ross. But but that's what he, Wagner talks about. He gave a really good interview on Fistful of College, which is the Flow Grappling podcast. Uh, shout out to them. And I love the interview because he talks about like he just does what's allowed in a match, yeah. and then he'll apologize to guys after the match. Like, look, that's how he competes. Yeah. And if it's allowed, like he's going to do, it. and that's totally fine. Yeah. But he'll a lot of times like apologize to guys after the match. I'm like, man, you're a real nice guy, Wagner. Yeah. So when this he, is, when when you're not on the mats going. Yeah, but he's him. he's mean on the mats. So I like to see that, and he pushes a pace, and he's exciting. That's why like he is one of the f- my favorite guys to cover because he will not really even game a rule set. He like does what is allowable in the rules and I love whenever a guy single-handedly can get a single technique banned in many places because so many places have now banned the smother choke because Wagner did it so often and uh, I respect him for that so. so and by the way he's able to get the pass on on Ross Nichols. oh yes yeah. yeah. are these guys in the same division for ADCC I have no idea oh god I need, I need to keep a list above the computer screen here of just all of the guys in each division for ADCC, because we're seeing more and more guys that are in ADCC matching up on super fights like this. Yep. And it'll be curious to see, like, as we get close to ADCC, who has faced each other in the near recent past. Yeah. So that was a good match. Wagner Hoster wins a decision. And it was honestly a little closer of a decision than I thought it was going to be. I would have still given it to Wagner, but I think it might have even been a split decision. I think it was a split it decision. It was split. So that was, uh, it was, it was close. Next match we're talking about is Ethan Krellenstein defeating Tom Haplin by armbar. Yeah. Um, never, ever let Ethan Krellenstein on your back. Holy shit. Dude, this is what... Um, this match looked really similar to the Keith Krikorian match in ADCC Trials East Coast from Krellenstein. Yeah. Krellenstein gets the back and just has beautiful back control. Just unbelievable and just control. on the back, on the back, on the back, on the back. This With is actually... Like, this is another really, really good match on this card. Murderous, like, rear naked choke attempts. Like... The the kind that even with your arm in trying to defend the choke, it still looks so uncomfortable. It looks unbelievable. Yeah, like just like it looks like it sucks. Not even like it looks like it's close, but it looks like the entire it's gonna suck the entire time you're defending it. I had one coach, I forget who it was years ago. Everything above the neck is the neck. Yeah. And Ethan took that to heart and is just choking the face, choking over. And it like you can see Tom and by the way, props to Tom. He put up a hell of a fight yeah. for this. And right before the finishing sequence, Ethan has Tom, like, what I thought was dead to rights and rear naked choke. Like, yeah. I thought he had him. I was like, okay, he's going to tap. And you saw Tom, like, continuing to fight the top elbow because it looked like Ethan was almost trying to do it short choke style where he's across the face and he almost has, like, a high elbow rear naked choke grip because he's trying to pull in and not, like, turn and pull back like he's across the neck because he he's across the face. And Tom's doing a really, really good job of fighting the elbow in that position because you're trying to turn. He's fighting up, fighting up, fighting up, and they reset the position. And 
Ethan goes, all right, well, this guy's not going to let me choke him. Like, he just, it's not going to happen. And he switches to a beautiful armbar from the back. And Tom defends it for a little bit, but Ethan's able to get it. Really, really impressive transition from the back. Really, really impressive defense from Tom. I mean, you would have tapped many, many other people in that oh, position. Oh, 100%. So, anything else in this match? Nope. All right, let's move on to the next one. Another, another match to watch on Polaris. So next match, we have Michael Perez defeating Darren O'Connell by decision. We have Eduardo Rios defeating Santori Luis by decision. Lilius. What'd I say? Luis. Yeah, man, I, I butchered names, Emil. You've left me hanging here having to read the names. <laughs> okay. Next match, we have Tommy Langak defeating Sebastian... Brosh. Brosh. By... Ta- how do we... I thought it was pronounced differently. Maybe. I don't know. That's how I'd read it. So this was fucking ridiculous. Tommy is unbelievably dominant in this match and he's his triangles were so ridiculously fast his triangle he throws up that triangle so quickly yeah and like he can lock his legs together he doesn't like he throws it straight a lot of times he doesn't really cut the angle when he's throwing it he locks it up really really straight and he starts attacking the arm a lot initially we first first sequence of the match tommy jumps uh, like a flying triangle and then immediately start going starts going for sebastian's arm and i was like okay he's probably going to get that and you see sebastian just kind of weather the storm weather the storm weather the storm and just eventually is able to get out of the triangle and i was i was super impressed about that yeah and then langacker continues to push the pace push the pace push the pace throws up more triangles and more triangles throughout the match yeah it was and like not just triangles but you know crazy barambolos you know back takes has a beautiful back his finishing sequence on the back take was just crazy yeah like sebastian's in the process of passing and tommy's able to like grab a a high pants grip like i call it the butt crack grip yeah or like whatever there should be a better name for that grip yeah and he yanks him down into like a baby bolo type back take it's the grip that everyone tries to use on the meows yeah where it's like that center where it always pulls the pants down like halfway and we all kind of pretend like it's not a little weird but it is Pulls it down halfway, gets the back, you know, and Sebastian is trying to basically do the what I call the wrestler escape, where Tommy's like super high on his shoulder. So trying to shuck him off. Yeah. So instead of being like chest to back, Tommy's like midsection belly button line is on Sebastian's shoulders. And Sebastian is trying to like like hop him, like get a tripod and knock him off the top end. And Tommy, to his credit, is able to stay in this position and starts fighting for the lapels. Yeah, and he it looks like he gets to to me it looked like he got a uh, bow and arrow choke, but uh, they're calling it a slide in choke. Slide in choke. I learned it as a zipper choke. Yeah. Basically, where it's like you slide the hand in, and then with your opposite hand, basically. So the first hand is set in on the cross side, on the either same side or cross side collar. I couldn't. I literally can't see the hands from the finish. And then you take your bottom hand and you and you pull the lapel down through your own hand, and it slides your first hand grip up closer to the neck. And um, it's a it's a slide in choke. It's a zipper choke. It's like a variation of uh, like a sliding X choke. Pick your name. It's, this is a choke that has a ton of different names. I'm bad at all of them because yep. uh, my gi choke game is is weak to say the least. So uh, super impressive from Tommy Langacker. Great like, match. Dude has looked better and better and better ever since that. Like I want to say 2016 or 17. 2017 is really where he showed he can start to compete at that highest level, and I'm super excited to see more from him. Mm-hmm. So next match we have Tarek Hopstock defeating Edwin O'Flanagan. Owen. Ian Owen, man, I looked Owen at it. O'Flanagan. I thought it was the O'Flanagan that's going to screw me up, and then I forgot the first name is different. It's spelled the yep. uh, is it Welsh or is it who the fuck knows European so, way? Tarek defeats Owen by straight ankle lock. Dude, Tarek on this on this finish here gets super low, and he does it like the this. He finishes the ankle lock belly down and in the scary way, where he like bucks on the ankle lock. I'm just moving my chair here, and he like kicks out, and that's what finishes it. So it's an explosive finish on the ankle lock. Yeah. And uh, the camera angle is a little funny on it; you can't really see, but you can see like he's doing these like jittery motions as he's trying to like snap the ankle lock down belly down, and then he does one of them, and the ref goes oh, and stops it, and Owen's tapped. Really crazy finish. You do not see a whole lot of finishes like that. Really good. Ash Amos defeats Ed Ingemels by decision. Freddie Vosgrone defeats Halder Valson by decision. Dude, Ari- Freddie, wait, hold up. Freddie comes out in that singlet every single time and then wrestles a little bit and then immediately goes for the legs and it throws me off every single time I it's see it. It just goes for the legs. I mean, like, it's a dude, it's a ripped guy in a bright red singlet. Bright then, red. Then playing, like, De La Hiva, which is like 
amazing this yeah it's like a guy on his back and on the legs and it's just like freddie gunpoint gets a really deep choke and um eventually yeah it's a guillotine i think it's a hey, guillotine or like an arm and guillotine I think. yeah one of the two but it was this is a shot match some good back and forth but um yeah congrats to freddie no. uh next we have aria Efansmaz defeating jamie hughes by bow and arrow choke pedro diaz defeats nobuhiro sawada by decision and then we had a number of dark matches as well that are listed in our results, but I did not see them because they were dark. Yeah. So anything else on this event? That's it. All right, looking forward to the next one. I'm really happy that they're doing um, – so we're, ne- we're probably going to see um, Theon Davies defending her title, hopefully the next event. And then hopefully we're going to see Wagner Hosha um, competing at whatever weight class this was. I forget what weight class this was. He's not, he's not the number one contender for that belt, so we get to see him fight for the belt for Polaris. And I like that they, I like that more organizations are doing this like number one contender spot because it starts to create divisional rankings where it's like, hey, it here's a path to a title in our organization. Right. And like you can it's see, a okay. more systematic. And I like that. Again, Polaris doesn't hold events hugely frequently but i love i love what they're doing of their paying grapplers i love they have really good production quality they have picture in picture commentary as always was amazing it's on fight pass the stream is smooth like it does so many things right their website is easy it's good to navigate there's results up they have profiles on the grapplers like they're doing all the right things that we want to see at a professional organization and i'm super happy they're around and i love their events yeah so on to our recap of Fight to Win 105 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. This event paid at a total of $24,429 in salaries and commissions and was headlined by Zaki Behens defeating Vitor Oliveira by decision. And that was Fight of the Night for the Black Belts. Where do you want to start on this one, we'll Emil? start at the top. Uh, so Zaki Behens and Vitor Oliveira, it was a very pensive match. You know, uh, there was a lot of sort of subtle grip fighting. It was maybe not the most explosive match. It was a slower match. Uh, there's... Out of this match, though, came one of the coolest still photos I've seen forever come out of like a grappling event, and it's a picture of Izaki Behens just belly down on the on Vitor's ankle, and it, it looks like the camera. I'm not sure if it's Mike Callenbass or another photographer is like three and a half inches from Izaki's face, and it's this <laughs> cool like upward shot with the lights all in the background, and it was like, God damn, that is an amazing camera shot that's going to be used forever on everything Izaki Behens is on from now on. So, good match. Zaki Behens gets the uh, gets the victory on this one. Next match, we had Kevin Williams defeating Daniel Roberts by inside heel hook, and that was submission of the night for the Black Belts. This is a great match, um, and it's a great example of how there is two sides to a lot of leg positions here. You know, it's a you know, live by the heel hook, die by the heel <laughs> hook type, <laughs> type situation. So, uh, Daniel's on the mat and seated guard, and he shoots in for saddle position. So he's he's kind of shooting up on Kevin Williams, who's standing over him. And Kevin just immediately grabs a hold of the near leg and sits in to his own saddle. So it's like at this point a 50-50 shootout, except that he has all the momentum of falling back. Because he's standing. This. He's standing. So he grabs the heel hook up in the standing position. And, and then he when, just fucking falls. When you it. see guys do that, it's such a hard thing to defend from, as the guy on the mat because the angle on your heel hook is changing. And the angle on the top, it's one of the few situations where, honestly, you probably want to be the guy in the standing position if you're going to go for the heel hook and you, and you bite first or at the same time as the guy in the bottom. Because the guy in the bottom has to roll through, but you really can't roll through as the t- uh, top opponent is falling back and because the top opponent has the heel in this position he falls back and it's almost impossible to change the angle enough and he's able to get the tap get the tap really cool finishing sequence and like you said emil live by the heel hook you die by the heel hook that's right so deserve deservedly submission light for the black was anything else on this match nope all right that was a that was a good match on to the next one todd ryan defeats luke woodard by woodard, to hold. thank you why am i reading the names Okay. We're 71 episodes in, Emil. Everyone knows I'm the shit name guy. All right. Tyler Lee defeats Leonardo Picana by decision. Todd Whaling defeats Jose Loria by knee bar. Dude, Todd threw me off here. Yeah. He had a brown belt rash guard on, and I'm looking. I saw I saw this. I was like, I thought we were in the black belts now. I'm confused. And uh, no, nope, black belt match regardless. Yeah. And this is, a, this is a really good match. I like this match a lot. Yeah. It was it was excellent. Um. You know, Todd was playing a lot of guard uh, at this point and, um, you know, fighting off uh, Jose. And at one point, Jose it puts him in a really dangerous position. I think he, he even gets mount on him. And, uh, uh, sorry, Jose gets Todd in mount. 
and Todd is able to escape and he's able to invert and yank out a leg and starts attacking it. And well, he starts getting like a toe hold at first and he starts to bring it around and you see them. He's like kind of, he has a heel hook for a little bit. Yeah, he's in like a pensive position, like waiting to fight the grips enough where he can kind of go back and extend. And then he rolls all the way over and it can perfect camera shot you're looking directly at the knee line directly at an extended position and just extends on a really great knee bar is able to get the finish it's a great adjustment to you know when jose was was rotating todd goes he, he reads it he switches from the heel hook right into the knee bar and it is a it is a savage and knee bar he gets that figure four leg lock position that i like yeah. so much like i think i honestly like you saw craig jones do it at quintet and I, you've seen guys before for many many years do this but for me at least that was the first moment where because i'd play with this knee, this particular knee bar a lot and for some reason with the figure four of the legs in this position it's just such a stronger knee bar there's something about the way that like it forces you to pinch your knees together and this is just a beautiful example of like why that finishing sequence is so good hips through Camera angle is perfect on it. Really great finish on the knee bar. So on to the next match, we had a black belt judo match. Sean McC- McCann versus M- M- Meal with the names. Scott McCann defeats Michael Ballestero by decision. Uh, now for the brown belts. We have Hunter Colvin defeating Dan Dykeman by armbar. Dude, Dan came out aggressive. Dan took this, act- took this match on like... I think he weighed in for another match, and then he went up because Hunter's opponent pulled out. So Dan steps the fuck up to fight this monster, and yeah. uh, Hunter. So he immediately jumps guard on a Hunter, and Hunter goes, "Oh, cool." He's not really jumping guard. It looks like he was trying to do a scissor takedown. Oh no! At the, at the beginning of the match, like the first sequence oh, of see, the match, see, see. Yeah, yeah. Dan jumps guard, and Hunter just goes, does this giant slam oh, immediately, yeah. <laughs> and you're like, "God, Dan!" That was actually I had to rewind it to watch it twice. I was like, "Oh, look at that! That's amazing!" And so. Funny thing, the day before I had watched, um, we didn't have a ton of events to cover this weekend, so I actually got to watch some MMA, and, and um, Pancrase was on. And one of the first matches, bouts of the f- first Pancrase fights on was a men's 115-pound strawweight bout, and I saw a guy get triangled and then knock the guy out from like the rampage slam in the triangle. And you don't you don't see that very often. You don't see men's straw weights very often either. So it was cool to see that. And then you see Hunter do the exact lift up in the guard and just slam down. You're like, yep, we're in fight to win rules. So uh, really good. Hunter looks really really good in this entire matchup. Again, he's on a streak right now, especially in that area. Yeah, absolutely. He looks completely fucking dominant. Um, so at at one point in this match, um, Dan goes for a scissor takedown. Hunter gets the body lock. He takes the back. He oh, he just beautifully awaits the reaction. And right Dan's super low on the body. Like Hunter is like, uh, he has Dan's shoulders like almost at like his his ab line or his chest line as opposed to like nice and high up. And so he knows that Dan is going to try to rotate into him in like the guard position. And he anticipates that and throws his legs over and locks up just a beautiful triangle in transition. Looked really similar to the triangle transition we saw um, like Andrew Cockle hit versus Rob Best, like really similar on the spin through. You just go for the arms to the triangle and Hunter's able to pinch the knees together, get the arm bar, and really, really good match. Exciting. Yeah. So on to the next match. We got Jordan Patrick defeating Ketra Bartek by arm bar, and that's... Oh, nope. The next match is submission of the night. Chris Hutchinson defeats Eric Onyago by flying arm bar. And that was submission of the night for the brown belt. This is like a minute and 15 into the match. Like they, So they've reset them standing... He gets his grip and he launches into a triangle armbar. It's fucking awesome. It's 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 instantaneous. You know, dude, I love. I feel like there should be a submission of the night and then like flying shit of the night. Yeah, because <laughs> we, see, cause we see it's like in it's just a pro events. We see so many guys throwing up flying. Like I think Polaris had two or three of them. Fight to win this week had at least three of them. Like they're just just everywhere now. Like guys are throwing that flying shit. From the beginning Cause and getting it done. Some of them are fairly low risk, you know, like if you miss it, you've, you've jumped guard more or less. You yeah, know, you if, pu- if you've doing pulled right. guard or jumped guard. Yep. Like, I think that we're seeing we're seeing a resurgence of the flying triangle in a big way on these pro events. Hell and yeah. how many highlights do you see on Instagram every week of like dudes hitting flying triangles competition? Yep. Like it's that is a thing. I think honestly a lot of gyms don't train them a whole lot. So you're seeing a lot of guys just getting nailed with them and it's it's something to really be aware of. I've started throwing them before I broke my back and shit <laughs> well maybe leaping at your opponents and you know could have contributed to that hey Mel, i see a, a causation or cor- correlation thing here <laughs> I mean, you might not be wrong 
So on to so the next match. We got Cody Nieto Clark defeating Melvin Scott by heel hook. Uh, this is a great finish. So Cody goes in for knee shield half, and he's lifting Melvin backwards. It looks like he's going for the Craig Jones style inversion to attack the saddle. But instead of attacking the leg that he has trapped, he launches over. Well, first he knocks Melvin back on his butt, and then he shoots over to the far leg. And then he gets an outside Ashigarami and finishes an outside heel hook. So I love this particular sequence because I play a lot of that like low butterfly guard, and so you can not. He does the thing that I love to do. You, you knock guys back, and they start to like reset and come in. And as they do, they put all their weight on the same side leg, and you can roll all the way through and finish it like this. Beautiful sequence, really high percentage. Cool to see get, see it getting hit by a brown belt in a pro event. Hell yeah! On to the next match. Uh, Tyler Murrah defeats Troy Everett. The Night Pigeon uh, by Flying Triangle. By Flying Triangle. <laughs> and the commentators actually called this like before, like right before it happened. They're like, man, Tyler is strong. He moves a lot. And, he says, uh, expect something fast and explosive or unexpected from Tyler early on. And at 17 seconds in, he hits a Flying Triangle. He he readjusts on the ground. He actually, Troy slams him like pretty fucking yeah. hard. Um, Troy but, knows the rules. But, you know, Tyler is able to hang on and get... You know, it looked really strong and 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 get the tag. Yeah, because Troy's doing all the right things. He had his hands together. He was pushing. He was defending the triangle correctly. But Tyler was able to just just close that space and get and get the submission. Yeah, on to the next match. Troy Edmund Russell defeats Alan Nguyen, Nguyen by armbar. Um, and then, sorry, Bink Knox defeats Dan Dykeman by toehold. So Dan Dykeman taken doing double duty on this card. Always props the dudes that that go up and wait and then do two matches in a night so yeah. props to bro, props to dan like that's that's no joke fighting twice on a pro event damn props to dan sean blay defeats steve hudson by decision and that was fight of the night for the brown belts on to the final match for the brown belts diego alfonso emil's pointing to me here because the name is very difficult to uh, pronounce uh pincha lugay pitchalute Lingue. Pichilingue defeats Randy Ray by split decision. That's that is that might be as far, as far as like the difficult names, one of the more difficult names you ever had on the show. Aside from when we covered the UWW wrestling event oh, and yeah. everyone was Eastern European <laughs> and I butchered and even Josh butchered a bunch of names. So shout out to Diego, Diego Alfonso. Sorry for butchering your name so bad because I know that was not even anywhere close. Congrats on your win. On the purple and blue belt results. Mariangel French defeats Mala Turner by split decision. And that was fight of the night for the purple and blue belts. Jonas Goins defeats Monty Bryant by rear naked choke. Marshall Troy defeats Nick Pendergrass by decision. Connor Dibler defeats John Hollis by knee bar. Nick Reeves defeats Jerry Dearman by decision. Colby Garrett defeats Shea Conley by decision. Dominique Brooks defi- defeats Peter Watkins by decision. Defeats? Yeah, I know. Rachel Garcia defeats St- Stephanie Madden by decision. Steven Jerome Swan defeats Karsten Kirk by decision. Jordan Langston defeats Corey Warren by decision. You, know, you can't just take when I give you shit on stuff. You, you got to remember that like I am not the the name guy on purpose, and that like <laughs> I have no in any way leg to stand up when giving you shit about pronunciation or fumbling your words. Fucking or, a right. Yeah. Uh, Nathan Craigel defeats Eric Zema by decision. Hunter Kennedy defeats Nate Laurentino by decision. Nick. Budnick defeats Jose Ramos by armbar. Kyle Cass defeats Daryl Wilson by decision. Corbin Crisp defeats Jared Yates by Kimura. And that was submission of the night for the Purple Belts. Sean Lewis defeats Corey Piercy by split decision. Keith and Cass defeats Charlie Mills by decision. Zach Shambles defeats Mo Brown by decision. Jesse Dixon defeats Daniel Grass by decision. Chris Little defeats Joey Yeager by armbar. Tristan Russell defeats Dylan Bassinger by armbar. Rick Chima defeats Tyler Hunter by heel hook. Uh, in the kids' division, Nash Iser defeats Keegan Hollis by rear naked choke. And that was fight of the night for the kids. And Jet Thompson defeats Bobby Burke by triangle. And that was submission of the night for the kids. So, uh, yeah, I give you a lot of shit. Back um, episodes, that probably like 50 or 60 episodes ago I had to do one of the preview sections alone because Josh and I had forgotten about event and I had to read through all the names it took me like 25 minutes and like six or eight different recordings to not butcher it so bad that we couldn't release it so uh I've gotten better but me will never let me give you shit for butchering your name 
<laughs> so that does it for Fight Through 105 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Replays are up now. Highly recommend go back and watch it. So moving on to a quick recap of Dorino versus Gleason Tebow on Titan FC 53. This event was a was I think the first combat jiu-jitsu match that Titans ever run and it was interesting for two things. One, they have a different rule set than EBI uses and pretty much everyone else uses for combat jiu-jitsu, which is you can strike on the feet or you can do open hand slappy strikes on the feet. And again, Dorino, Gilbert Burns and Gleason Tebow are both veterans of jiu-jitsu and MMA. So uh, this is more interesting. They also had in a cage, so you saw a lot of cage takedowns, or you saw two cage takedowns, and um, it, I think, is a better way to do combat jiu-jitsu, because you can pressure in, and you can get guys on the fence, you can get takedowns from there, you can actually do more clinch work, it makes the wrestling on the feet a little more interesting, because guys are more hesitant to engage, but when you engage, there's actually some, like, skin in the game for it, Right. so it's definitely a different format, uh, at the end, Dorino is basically able to get the back for Gleason and finish her with a rear naked choke. Um, at one point, Gleason hits a really interesting takedown off the off the fence. Basically, he has Gilbert Burns pressured into the fence, and he hits like like a looping, like slapping hook that kind of makes Dorino lift his arms up, and he's able to get a body lock takedown off the fence. So, interesting format, um, interesting match. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's definitely you know having the cage there. I think is you know I honestly think that's you know, as important as allowing slaps in terms of like how it changes the the dynamics of the match. Because when you can get someone when you can back someone up, yeah. It it really changes how it changes your escapes, changes control, changes. You put, all you put that cage stuff. wrestling into it. Yeah. And also like there's no resets now. It's yeah. so, like you're contained within a cage. So I, I do like that from I really I realize that's why I like cage fighting so much is because there's a pace there's a difference in pacing because at a certain point, you're both pressing into each other and action is going to occur in some sort of clinch right. as opposed to in a matted surface like, oh, they can't do close, the ref's going to stop. I mean, there's like this there's this weird gray area that happens on the edge of the mat where right. it's like guys where engage people or don't know engage. They can game the, the edge yeah. of the mat. So you can't actually, game a cage. I do, like, I do like having a hard boundary and, um, you know, I think that that could be interesting just in pure jujitsu as well. You know, like having an actual boundary there rather than yeah. just like a third. I think there's only there's only a, a couple of motions that do like S. Uh, Chael Sun's organization uh, submission underground S U G. I think is what we call it. Sug. Um, they are do they do their event in a cage, and it, you see a lot of the same things. You see a lot of cage wrestling and a lot of like cage jujitsu. And then third coast grappling also has like a matted wall on the back of their. Um, like stage that they let guys use if they're working off of it. And then once they're down on the ground, they'll pull them away from it sometimes. And I, I do like that. I do like the dynamic that the wall does add um, because I like to see like different stuff in jujitsu. So interesting matchup. Uh, it's on again on fight pass. Easy to watch. It's on uh, Titan FC 53. You can click. I think it's like six or seven fights down from the top. You can just click over Burns and listen to T Watch the bout. Anything else to add? No. All right. Let's move on to the preview section. So on to our preview of the 2019 IBJJF PANS being held in Irvine, California. In California, like most major events for IBJJF are held at this point. Yep. And, you know, the PANS are one of the big events. You know, it's like, uh, it's a marquee event. So It's a major. It's, it's a major event. Like UAE does their Grand Slam events and... IBJJF has Pans, Brazilieros, Euros, and Worlds. Worlds. Yep. And then they're trying to make American Nationals a thing, and it's kind of becoming a thing. I I don't I feel like Pans should already kind of you know accommodate that you know, and it's usually held in the U.S. anyway, so you know it already it already is American Nationals. Yeah, exactly. That's reasonable. It's American then, Nationals. You can be plus... an American National champion and a Pans champion. So, yeah. Dude, it's... Pans is looking real, real exciting. It's this real. Year. We so... have. A, a we'll, lot of guys. Sorry, yep. you continue. We will. Uh, we'll just read some of the marquee names from the adult black belt divisions. So, if you've um, never heard us preview a IBJJF major event, because they're super, um, I think the technical word is like clusterfucky. Yeah. Um, there's so many matchups. There's so many divisions. There's so many major guys registered. I think like the largest division for the men's black belts is something like, let's see, looks like it is 28. Yeah, 28 yeah. competitors. So we can't, we're not just going to read through. We don't have brackets yet because it's Monday afternoon. Yep. Um, we have no brackets yet, so we're not going to read through and talk about potential matchups. We're just going to read through some of the big names that we are looking forward to seeing on the event. And then as brackets come out, we usually post some other stuff on our social media, like Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook for some stuff we're looking at. Keep an eye out for those. But so this is how we do it. Uh, for the male black belts at adult at rooster weight, um, we have Kristen Woodman C. Mike Musumanchi, uh, Nobihira Sawada, yep. 
Kyoji Shiramoto, and we have Hiago Souza. Yep. In the light featherweight division, we have Joao Miao and Paulo Miao. That's really yep. interesting that they're both in the same division. I think that's one of the biggest things for this division is, uh, fuck, who's it? it is Paulo coming down or is Ja going? I can't remember which is which. Yeah. I should fucking know that. Man, we are professionals here. While they're in the same division for the first time, and as as I've been on the podcast, I haven't seen the oh, two yeah. of them in a... Well, Paulo was suspended for a long time. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, it's the first time we've seen them in the same division in a bit here, so it'll be interesting. IBJF will probably put them on different sides of the bracket, so they're not going to meet until the finals, and they'll probably close out. But um, who else do we have in this division we'll talk about? Uh, let's see. Fernando Suarez is in this division. Uh, Joseph Sun Lee is in this division. Rene Lopez is in this division, and Lucas Panero is in this division. I honestly feel like the meows. Yeah, I think m- they should have that m- handily. Might close out this division. So oh, wow. at featherweight, we have Isaac Doderlin, Kennedy Mar- Martial. Um, we have Mateus Evangelista. Um, Who else do we got in this division? We got uh, Mateus Gabriel. We have uh, Shane Jamil Taylor. And oh yeah, Cole Franson. Dude, yeah, that's Shane. a banging division. Yeah, dude, this is the first time I think we've seen Shane at a major IBJJF event. In, maybe since his win at Worlds. Yeah, I think I don't think he was at Euros, so this would be super exciting. This is the first time. I watched me completely wrong. Oh, Shamir Shanch is also in this division as well, so it'll be really fun. I love seeing Shane compete in the gi, uh, so this is probably a lead up for him for Worlds coming up. Yeah. So moving on to the lightweight division, we have, uh, let's see, Jeremy Jackson. We have Oswaldo Moschino. Cushinho. We have. I always I always mess up his name. We have Granato Canuto. We have Gilson Nunez. Uh, we have, man, it's a giant division. John Taylor Combs. Mm-hmm. Insun Jang is in this division. Levi Jones Leary is in this division. This is a really exciting division. This is a division of 24. The lightweights, again, these, the higher weight divisions always get, like, that bell curve always gets huge. So this should be a real exciting division as well. Under the middleweights, we got Azaki Bahens in there. We have Claudio Calazans. We have Michael Lira Jr. We have, let's see, um, hmm. <laughs> Dante Leone is in this division. We got Edmund Kim in this division. We got Jamie Canuto in this division. We also have uh, Igor Pava, Felipe Silva. Yeah, fun, dis- fun, fun division. And then onto the heavyweight division, we got Mateus Deniz. We have Tarsus Humphreys. We have Hulk. His name is so easy now that I know his name. Yeah. Dude, I love the guys with the nicknames. Just like then Hulk. We have Dominic Bell in this division. I think this is... Maybe Dominic Bell's first uh, majors as a black belt, but I might be incorrect in that. I don't know if he was at Europeans or not. Devontae Johnson's in here. And Matt Layton. Sweet. So that'll be really exciting. We might, so potentially, we might see the uh, the matchup we were supposed to see at Subspectrum. Hudson Mateus, yeah. Sweet. Hudson Mateus is at this one as well. Um, awesome. Excellent. Looks a lot of fun. And then on to the heavyweights, we got Kanan Duarte, Adam Wardzinski, we got Patrick Gaudio, we got Tex Johnson, Leandro Lowe. Jesus. Yeah, good Good luck with that division. Yeah. There's, there's a bunch of exciting dudes in that division. God damn, all big names. Yep. And then on to the super heavyweight division, damn. We got Muhammad Ali, Tanner Rice, James Popolo. We got um, Gilles, yeah, Gutenberg, Gutenberg Parada is on this. We ha- he, I think we just saw him a couple weeks ago on Fight to Win. Yep. Uh, let's see. We have mm, Roberto Tortobas and uh, Leo Nogueira. And, awesome. oh, and, Hel- and Helton Silva Jr. is in here as well. And on the ultra heavyweights, we have Max Jimenez. We have Antonio Braganetto. We have Gustavo Diaz and... Guillerme Suarez Santos. Then for the females, uh, the Roosterweight division, we have Serena Gabrielli and Misa Bastos. The light featherweight division, we have Talita Alencar and, let's see, uh, Patty Fontes. In the featherweight division, I'm not again, I'm not reading every single name because that would just take too, too fucking long. Fionn Davies. In the featherweight division, Array Alexander. I think this is a, uh, Array's first um, major back as well. I think she had an injury last year, and so it'll be exciting to see her. She has had some good matches. I saw her match versus Alan Cart fight to win 53, I think. Was she a on of TLI fun. for Quintet? No, she was not. It was—I'm going to blank the woman's name. Okay. No, she was not on, on that event. 
Um, and that, I think I brought her up as I was surprised she wasn't. I think she was still injured at that time. So exciting to see here. Under the lightweights, we have Jenna Ray Bishop. We have Bianca Basilio. We have Nicole Sullivan. We have Gabriella McComb. And we have Amanda Aliquin. Yeah, that's going to be that's, that's a good that's ass stacked. Division. It's division of five. Uh, under the middleweights for the females, we have Anna Corlina Vieira. Ooh, that's exciting. I think this is the first time I've seen her black since black since back since black belt CBD. She, I think she had an injury from a leg lock attempt on that event, so it'll be exciting to see her again. Um, let's see. We have Raquel Canuto as well, and we have Jessica Swanson. Oh, Elizabeth um, Halleck as well. In the medium heavyweight division, we have Maria Miljasic. We have Nivia Morena. We have, give me that name. Monique Elias. Yeah. And in the heavyweight division, we have... Um, Tatia Noguera, we have Natalia De Jesus, uh, Ale- Alejandra Gonzalez, and in the super heavyweight division, the one that everyone's talking about, we got Gabby, Gabby Garcia. Garcia. She's back. Making a return. I'm not sure how long she's been out, but she's been in MMA for a while. We haven't seen her compete it's in a been, major. been, I think, a couple years. I think so. I should look it up, I but I'm not going to. I think it's been probably two years. At least. I think so. So potentially we're going to see the, um... oh, no, she's on this vision. Never mind. Well, we got Jessica Flowers as well in this yep. division. Hilary so. Van Orm is in this division as well, and Allison Tremblay. So that's exciting. Um, it'll be it'll be interesting to see what Gabby Garcia looks like coming back into jiu-jitsu and coming back into gi jiu-jitsu after a couple of years off. Yeah. Again, I would assume she still has it, but it will definitely be interesting. I'm excited to see. Again, I love when MMA people come back to the dark side that is jiu-jitsu and uh, go back in, especially when they come back into the gi, because usually you'll see people come and go into jiu-jitsu, and then you don't see them in the gi as much once they've made the transition, so it's awesome to see her coming back into the gi. Super excited. Pans is going to be a trip. Yep. It's a major event for us, so it's always uh, you're going to hear us be very, very tired next week yep. as we try to cover all of it. Uh, you got any matches you want to see us break down or hear us talk about, shoot us a message, shoot us a DM on something like uh, Instagram. Honestly, Instagram is probably the best way to get a hold of us. It's just I find it the most readily available platform for messaging, yeah. which is weird considering it's not a great platform for messaging. But um, you got anything else, Emil? That's it. All right, awesome. So this will be the section of the podcast where we preview EBI 19, the uh, – 135 is the bantamweights. Um, so it doesn't look like this event is happening. Yeah, there's a trailer out for it that says March 22nd. But if you check Fight Pass, there's nothing. Facebook, Instagram. You check every other place that normally has stuff like this, there's nothing. So if you look on Inch by Inch TV, they have a they have a YouTube page. And I think I got this because I was watching the last event live and they played this trailer during the last event. And um, they haven't taken it down yet. So hmm. if I've completely missed this, uh, I apologize. I haven't seen anything come up on this, but the trailer is still up. It still says March 22nd. So um, if this event is, in fact, happening, someone please let me know. And uh, we might do like a bonus like preview show episode of it and talk about it a little, in a little more in depth during this week. But uh, as of now, I think this probably got moved and it's not happening. Right. So uh, anything else to add on that, Emil? No. All right. So if you find something, please let us know. Also happening this weekend is Senkaku Pro 3. We just don't have time to give it a preview this week. If you're interested in it and it's not IBJJF, go and watch it. I think it's going to be streamed. You can find more information about it on their Instagram page. Looks like a lot of fun matchups as well. Um, other than that, what else you got going on this week, Emil? Uh, just, you know, praying that this fucking hand heals itself. You know, I need a Wolverine that shit. Oh, my hand's broken. Man, I got a broken back. <laughs> and it's getting worse. <laughs> Like, I got a gym membership to my local gym because uh, I've not exercised in, like, a year almost since I, since I got the new house. I haven't had a gym membership because I canceled the old one because oh, the other gym was closer to the old house. And I haven't bit the bullet and actually, you know, got a membership. Now since my back is so fucked up and I can't train jujitsu. Um, I was like, all right, let me do something for my body. And uh, I've been, like, biking really easily and, like, on elliptical like my PT told me to. And I think it's making it worse. <laughs> so uh that's been great this week oh man we need to get you some like fucking new age healing or some shit like or... some bubble wrap yeah we need, yeah. We need to carbonate me like han yep. until we have the technology because apparently i have fucking bonitis and um <laughs> my only regret is that i have bonitis you got a back you need a bacchiotomy a bacchiotomy so i'm doing like i'm doing like inversion tables and like trying to hang and look at all this stuff up online and trying to like not be an idiot and sit with correct posture but it's really bad I can't put my fucking shoes on. Damn, dude. And uh, my life is, it's its giving me tons of time for the podcast. Yeah. No, hey, that's true. That's thats a silver lining. Thank you, Ooh. Maine. 
much. Woo. So if you're out there training, you know, treat your body right. Yeah, teach yeah. body right. You it takes supplements. Don't do crack. Like not that I do crack, but like yeah, you know, it's just general guide, preventative general, general guideline. Too. Preventative health care. You know, I might actually start warming up and yeah. stop stopping skipping the warm warm-ups. up a little bit. Do some yoga. You know, take a stretch. But I'm I'm sitting in the sauna for a lot now, like usually twenty thirty minutes a day to try to like open up and like not be just so utterly broken because I would one day like change jitsu again. Yeah, like I'm pissed. Fight to win is coming to Baltimore on uh, April twentieth and. I can't be on it, yeah, because I can't touch my toes right now. Yeah, and uh, we're month four of me not being able to put my shoes on correctly. Hey, we can still go and cover that shit because it's gonna be uh, fucking awesome. We are gonna go. Hell yeah! Like hell yeah, and maybe even to Philly. Hell yeah! And I'm gonna try to get Matt to go to Boston and cover the Boston <laughs> one, dude. I fucking love cover. I love cover fight to win. Like even if it sucks that like I can't be on the card, but you'll get there. Yeah, but I'm still happy like we get to go, and it's like I can't. I'm not bed bound, so it's like look on the bright side. Yeah. it sucks I can't train now, and I miss it, and it makes me sad. But uh, this is a super down way to end the podcast. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I'm really broken right now, and like, like this is what jujitsu can do for you. You can live like Maine with a herniated disc in his back at 27 or 28, however old I am, <laughs> <laughs> and forget your age, dude. It's not. It changes every year, man. Like, just it just changes. Yeah, so uh, that's how take, time works. It, it, dude, time just keeps going. We've been doing the show for seventy-one episodes. Fuck yeah. Okay, we sorry, we have seventy-three episodes total. We have two bonus shows. You've been on this show for like twenty-five episodes almost. Holy shit! I think your first appearance on the show is episode forty-one with you and Ryan because Josh was like, "I'm on family vacation." I was like, "Oh shit, <laughs> I got to pull other hosts in." And I have to give you and Ryan the breakdown. Like, all right, this is how we do the show. This is what we do. You ready? And you were like, oh, "Let's do it." Yeah, fuck it. We're going live. We're going live. So, uh, yeah. All right, Emil. It's been good. It's been good. As always, I am Maine. I'm Emil. Take care of yourself. Yeah. We are the Grappling Rewind. See you on the mats. If you like the show, please consider sharing it on Facebook with the folks at your gym. It's the best way that we grow the show, and we really appreciate it. You can reach out to us on email. We also have Instagram. We have Facebook. We have Twitter. We have Google+. Plus. Until that shuts down. We have a website. If you have an event you would like to have us cover, please let us know. If you have a name, like most people do, and you'd like to have us stop butchering it, let us know. Reach out to us. The show is also available on YouTube, Spotify, in addition to iTunes and every other podcast service. We very much appreciate your time, and thank you.